in your book. Mm -hmm. Now, the art of prayer, for short, you raise some sentiments, especially in on authenticity, with the Hetu or the Kemetic spiritual houses uh, within the tri-state area. Why, why was it uh, necessary for you to bring that up? Well, that was meant to be a challenge and a charge to some of us in the conscious community because we have this habit of taking comedic names and images from the comedic legacy and naming our organizations after them and using comedic images for logos mm -hmm. while many of the same people are oftentimes reluctant and almost downright intimidated to, to actually practice the culture that we claim we revere so much. In the comedic tradition, we have a concept called Sema Ma'a Keru, which means union of thought, word, and deed. So coming from a comedic tradition, that represents having a comedic paradigm, not just in word and thought, but also deed. Mm -hmm. So being comedic consists of daily doings, monthly doings, annual doings, and communal doings. And these things serve as the yardstick on what determines what is authentic comedic or not. Okay. And just in closing to that statement, even though the word Kim means black, we are not doing justice to the magnitude of the comedic legacy by just the mere adoption of a few words and images. Mm -hmm. But you, you did uh, say something about embalming, and I'm bringing this up because in my tradition, there is one order that we call the Bayasi. Bayasi. And they are in charge of uh, tomb building, Mm -hmm. They're in charge of the, the dead. They're in charge of uh, uh, actually preparing the dead for burial. And uh, when you talked about the embalming, it brought me back to my childhood, especially when an elder dies, and then they have children, grandchildren, and great great grandkids who are married outside, mm. you know, sometimes within a 100 mile radius. They cannot all come to the burial on time. So these biases were responsible for embalming this person to keep the body fresh mm. until those people arrive. Mm. What was your objective of trying to bring that up, trying to compare the authenticity of the fact that even though you're practicing kemetic traditions, you're not completely practicing it. Mm. It's, it's interesting that you, you, you said the society is called the Bayasi. Right. Bayasi. So that, that corresponds in the kemetic tradition to a priesthood known as the Ka priest, mm -hmm. priest of the Ka or the Ka Sheti. Right. And they're, they're also responsible for embalming, and they're all, all, they're considered ancestral priests. They're responsible for off, making continuing to offer to our deceased ancestors. So that's our way of making that transition to of not necessarily being able to do the full rites like our ancestors have done. But that does not absolve us of the responsibility of addressing how our ancestor could go from being dead to a living conscious ancestor on the other side, which we have a. A, a valid relationship with. Mm -hmm. Now, the Ka priests are an advanced version of what you call a Wab priest or a purity priest. Okay. Mm. Mm. Most people in our lifetimes have known only one creation story. Uh, and sometimes we come to a realization that that creation story doesn't fit it, or mm. we don't see ourselves in that creation story. Mm -hmm. What is the uh, ancient Kemetic creation story? Actually, there are several versions. There's no one ancient Kemetic creation story because there were four major universities throughout the course of the land of Kemet. So there's several. And so at any given, t that, there's just several different perspectives on the approach to understanding creation. Right. Because we weren't there. True. <laughs> so we can't say this is what happened. We only have references, mm -hmm. likenesses, 
or attributes that we can study to give us further insight on what happened at the beginning of creation. But according to one text, it's called the Book of Knowing the Creations of Ra, and okay. it depicts the Creator speaking himself about how things were created. The Creator says, when I came into existence, when I brought myself into existence, existence itself came into existence. And it says, many were the beings that came forth from the utterances of my mouth. And I find that curious because we have to ask what beings, usually we think of things that came forth by the Creator's Word because in the Bible it teaches in the beginning was the Word, but what did that mean? How did creation come forth? He said in the comedic text, many were the beings that came forth that, from the utterances of my mouth. So those beings could be translated as Neturu, which in English we can translate as gods. Mm -hmm. So the important thing in that is when you talk about when the creation, the creator said existence itself came into existence, then it says many were the beings, these, the gods came into existence. So what we're seeing is the reconciliation of polytheism with monotheism. Polytheism we understand to be the, the worship of the belief of many gods and mm -hmm. monotheism is the worship and belief of one God. So you have the reconciliation of the two in the expression of what's known as monism, which is the unity of God. Because it said when God came into existence, existence itself came into existence. So God is one with creation. So creation or existence as we know it is an expression of divinity. Right. So that's why we call the creator in our tradition the yit mutnetir, which means the father, mother creator. So we're understanding the unity of the creator with, or the oneness of the creator with everything. So we're never in violation when we consider the creator he, she, it, because as I said before, the creator is everything that we can perceive and everything that we cannot perceive, everything yet no thing. Mm -hmm. So then it goes on to say he created, he's, he spat out Shu and Tefnut. Those are different expressions. Those are the divine beings that the Creator charges to govern creation. Right. Then it goes on to talk about the creation of the elements. Then it goes on to talk about the creation of human beings. So what this is teaching us is that human beings have a fourfold nature. Cosmic, divine, elemental, and earthly. So we can be a power, we could be empowered by pulling from at least four dimensions at any given time. Hmm. Most people across the globe use phrases and even quotations without knowing the antecedents of the phrases or quotations. Case in point, Christians preach the word of God knowingly or unknowingly that it has its antecedents in Africa. The ancient Kemetic script that you have mostly used in your book, The Art of Prayer, the Medunetta, has been corrupted to sound like somebody else's language. Mm. First, instill meaning on this writing now if you have a goal in bringing it back into the classroom. Mm. Well, first of all, we will discuss the meaning of the word Medonetta. Usually when you talk about a language of a people, the language is named after the people or some act or action of the people themselves. But when we say Medonetta, it is the words of God. So it's telling you who's the author of the word and it transcends any people or any act. Right. And it's arguably the oldest language in existence. So when we talk about language, language is the edification of one's culture. Mm -hmm. So for instance, when we look at, when we hear or listen to the Catholic mass, it is not, it does not have the same effect in English as it does when it's recited in Latin. True. When we listen to a Hebrew cantor or a Hebrew chanter, the service does not have the same resonance as it has in Hebrew as when they try to chant the same thing in English. Right. When we look at the Islamic tradition, I think from my experience in Islam, it was mandatory that you say the prayers in Arabic because those was, that was said to be the language of the angels. So in language, there's a, through the principle of osmosis, there's a transmission of knowledge, inspiration, and revelation, or should we say unvelation. So I just believe that it's time for the comedic unvelation. Okay. And what about this um, 
thinking about uh, bringing it into into the classroom. You think that that, that is a, a a goal? Yes, yes. And it starts with basic um, conversational metal nets, like how I started with greeting you with Iamatep, right. so it starts with just replacing basic English phrases. Actually, my experience in Islam inspired me to do that, like you were charged to do the prayer right. in Arabic, and that begins the interest in actually wanting to know more of the Arabic language, so we're following that same course with metal netter. So we, we see the metal netter in prayers and scripts and texts, but how do you conversate? in Meroneta, that's the next level. I see. But at, at this moment, are you teaching young people how to write the ancient script? And we have to teach the older people how to <laughs> write the ancient <laughs> script. <laughs> <laughs> first, <laughs> first things first. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Now, one quote, to think that a race of black men who are mm. today are slaves and the object of contempt are the same ones whom we owe our arts, sciences, and the use of speech. This was stated by Count C.F. Volney. Mm. Close quote. Now, the, there are three schools of thought on Africa and how Africa fell from grace. One school believes that Africans developed and advanced to a point where they could not go further. Another school believes that natural disasters brought about Africa's downfall. And the last school believes that Africans offended God and the punishment was to deprive them of cohesive intelligence. Where do you align or do you belong to your own school? Well, I believe all of what you said are extensions of the same principle, the same pathology. Mm -hmm. There's a comedic text that says, be not arrogant with your knowledge, for the limits of knowledge have not been set in any field. True knowledge is rarer than emeralds. Mm -hmm. So that's a check or that's a warning never to become arrogant and think you know everything and there's nothing left to learn. Right. Now, a later text said that the people will begin to cease looking at the works of Atum, which is the creator. They'll cease looking at the works of Atum with wonder and start seeing spirituality and the sciences as a form of burden. Mm. So that's the violation of the arrogance. And in my tradition, and I'm sure in your tradition and several other African traditions, when you violate, you invoke the wrath of the deities upon you, which usually come in the form of pestilence, natural disaster, and insanity mm -hmm. and we could agree right now that our people as a whole are out of their natural minds <laughs> so the only solution is to come back to ma'at which is truth justice righteousness and balance through applied metaphysics through culture hmm. now in in Bakavko, and that is my tradition, and I try to juxtapose this mm. with ancient Kemetic tradition because of the fact that uh, Europeans are trying to deprive Africans from belonging to mm. to ancient Kemet. Mm -hmm. uh, all the the uh, the, uh, the the monuments, the, the erections, the developments that we created there, even though we are no longer there, doesn't mean that. They, we didn't create them. Uh -huh. uh, I, I was in Egypt when I, I was. I went back there. I felt like, you know, I had uh -huh. come back home. Uh -huh. uh, my people are called Gurusi people, and we share borders. We, you know, we live across borders: Ghana and southern part of Burkina Faso. To invoke the spirit to speak. For example, uh, you take the glass of water and you notch, you know, the spirit, and then you call his name. Mm -hmm. That's how we invoke, you know, our spirits to get up, to rise up and get this water, or rise up and receive this prayer. That's how we do it. How do you do it in ancient Kemetic tradition? 